Welcome to the Lewy Body Dementia Caregiver webinar series. Today our topic will be behavior and mood symptoms in Lewy Body Dementia. A little bit about myself. My name is Jennifer Merrilies. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. I'm at the University of California, San Francisco in the Memory and Aging Center. My clinical work and my research focuses a lot on behavior symptoms in dementia and also on strategies for promoting family caregiver health and well-being. The topics we're going to talk about today are we're going to cover some of the more common behavioral and mood symptoms that characterize the Lewy body dementias. So we're going to talk about visual hallucinations, delusions, and a specific type of delusion called capgrass, sleep disturbance, and apathy. We'll review how brain anatomy and changes in neurotransmitter function impact mood and behavior. We're going to explore ways to manage these common behaviors and we'll also talk about the symptoms and how to manage and think about delirium. Let's first go over an overview of the stages of illness that we commonly see in Lewy body dementia and how each stage in general is associated with different mood and behavior symptoms. So in the early mild stages of dementia, we often see visual hallucinations, sleep disturbances, and apathy are often very common and, and often present pretty early in the disease course. Um, we also can see some changes in apathy or drive, anxiety, and depression. And we'll define each of these symptoms in a little more detail in a moment. In the more moderate or middle stage of Lewy body dementia, we often see increasing problems with delusions. Sometimes these delusions are more of a paranoid nature. Also, people may not recognize their home. Um, they may worry that someone is trying to do them harm. And a specific type of delusion called Capgras syndrome is when the person doesn't recognize, typically their spouse or someone very familiar to them, they typically don't recognize their spouse and feels like this person has been replaced by an imposter. In the more advanced stages of Lewy body dementia, we often see more psychosis or, dis or very disordered thoughts and agitation. Likely, we think this is a result of the diminished cognitive reserve in our patients. Our patients in the more advanced stages have a much tougher time kind of understanding what's going on around them and being able to respond appropriately. And then, of course, all of these behavior and mood symptoms are happening in the context of other cognitive physical, medical changes um, that result from Lewy body disease. So we recognize that it can be extremely challenging to manage things like hallucinations and paranoia in the context of a person who has fluctuating insight, fluctuating focus and attention, um, changes in their ability to move about and be autonomous and independent. So we recognize that there's a lot of challenges in, in managing these behaviors in the context of everything else that's going on. So what we thought would be nice to review a little um, briefly uh, brain anatomy and neurotransmitters um, as a way to help illustrate why these behaviors and these mood changes occur. And so let's first just look at basic sort of anatomy and physiology and a picture of a brain cell called a neuron. And these neurons uh, communicate with one another uh, through synapses or these connections between the neurons. And the, the messages that get sent are aided by neurotransmitters. And I've bolted the two neurotransmitters that are um, sort of specifically depleted in Lewy body disorders, so dopamine and acetylcholine. And um, as these levels of neurotransmitters change with illness, the normal function and the communication between the neurons is disrupted. And so as dopamine is depleted, um, we often think of that as being implicated and why people get more depressed. When acetylcholine is depleted, we often think of that as being implicated and why somebody might have hallucinations or delusions or, or problems with their memory. Now another important aspect in thinking about these illnesses relate to the changes in the proteins and their buildup in the brain. And all of these diseases, all of these different types of dementia all uh, result because of different proteins that build up in abnormal amounts in the brain. And in dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia, 
This protein is called alpha-synuclein. So these proteins occur naturally in the brain, but due to some mechanism that we don't clearly understand, begin to build up in abnormal amounts, and they take over those neurons that we just saw in the last slide. Um, and this alpha-synuclein, which is a component in Lewy body dementia, is a major component of the actual Lewy bodies, which are the, the main culprit in these disorders. And you can see from this slide, uh, in each of the different types of dementia, the spread of this, these abnormal proteins sort of take over the brain, and, and they sort of start in different parts of the brain. So in Lewy body dementia, um, which is the third diagram down, uh, first on the far left, you can see uh, examples of Lewy bodies under this slide. So those are the dark brown spots um, made up of alpha-synuclein, the primary lesions that are found in the neurons. And in Lewy body, typically this starts in the, the brain stem, the limbic system, and then spreads. And so the brain stem, um, that part in red, um, is affected. This is why we see a lot of the sleep disturbances, the hallucinations, and the motor problems in Lewy body disorders. And when the limbic system is uh, affected, that's often why we see anxiety, memory loss, um, and those sorts of symptoms. So let's spend some time really defining and understanding some of these symptoms that we've referred to. Um, let's look first at visual hallucinations, and a hallucination is a perception of something that isn't actually there. In Lewy body disorders, these are typically visual hallucinations, and they're typically non-threatening for the person. They're not something that uh, causes fear, but these hallucinations can also involve sounds and physical sensations. Um, they occur very frequently in, uh, in people that have dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, part of the core criteria for diagnosis, and less so in Parkinson's disease with dementia. Um, our patients usually describe these types of hallucinations as well-formed, very vivid, complex images. They often involve people, children, or animals. Uh, sometimes um, people will say not necessarily complain of having sort of frank hallucinations, but they may have a sense of a presence, that they might have a feeling that someone's looking over their shoulder. Um, and then they may have visual hallucinations, which is really what this picture uh, is, is depicting. So it's a misperception of a stimuli. So in this picture, there's a tree, there's a house, uh, there's a shepherd, um, but a person who's having an illusion looks at that and, and actually sees a face. Um, we've had patients that have uh, said that they see faces in trees. They may think that a, a sweater that's on the couch is actually a, a small animal, a cat or a dog. Um, dramatic or scary television programs uh, might be perceived as, as actually happening in real life. Um, so we have patients that have a hard time sort of discriminating between something that's real and something that they're watching on television. Um, we've had patients who um, say that alarming noises, their reflection in their mirror or a window, dark shadows, glaring lights um, are often perceived by them as, something, as someone in the room or, or even someone coming after them. And we think that the vividness of these hallucinations are really a result of the significant Lewy body pathological burden within the brain. Delusions and capgrass syndromes um, are uh, both delusions. A delusion is, an, is a fixed false belief. So um, a lot of times the delusion can be paranoid. So for example, our patients um, may uh, believe that someone's stealing from them. They may believe their spouse is cheating on them or that someone is out to get them. Um, so they can often be paranoid in nature. Um, they can often be related to memory loss. So we've had uh, patients that, uh, even though they've been retired for many years, um, have this mistaken false belief um, that they need to get to work um, or uh, that they need to take care of young children, um, even though their children are now grown adults. Um, so. These delusions are often really associated a lot with anxiety. That's a significant component of a delusion. And then the Capgras syndrome is a recurrent transient belief that a 
familiar person has been replaced by an imposter. Um, in our patients, this type of syndrome can last minutes to months. Um, it almost always uh, presents um, in patients that are also having hallucinations. And for any of you that have dealt with someone with this type of delusion or a cap grass, I think you can appreciate the fixed quality of the beliefs and that no amount of reasoning or logic can convince this person that their belief isn't real. Um, and we'll talk more about sort of strategies of dealing with that, but a, it's a, a delusion is something that you really um, can't talk the person out of. It's very, that's the, the fixed part of, of, of this uh, certain syndrome. This is a quote by one of our caregivers um, whose spouse had Lewy body dementia about this, these delusions in capgrass. Delusions are more frequent and intense. My wife insists that she will not get into the car with me until her husband comes to drive her. The other day I got her into the car and she opened the car door while I was driving to try to escape. So we're going to talk more about some non-medication environmental strategies um, to help deal with these kinds of situations. In this case, um, one important action would be to activate the childproof door locks um, uh, to help prevent any, anything from happening. Sleep disturbances, um, there's a lot of different ways in Lewy body uh, disease that sleep can be disrupted. And when you think back to that earlier slide uh, showing how the brain stem um, is affected in Lewy body disease. Um, I don't think it's surprising uh, to, to, to think about all the sleep uh, disruption that can happen. Um, it can take uh, many different forms. Um, two of the more common ones that we hear about a lot that I think caregivers struggle with are this dream enactment behavior. So the person with dementia will be flailing their arms and legs during their sleep, yelling, calling out. Um, often wake up with a feeling that they've been chased or that they are trying to rescue someone. Um, this sort of physical activity uh, in bed during sleep can be dangerous for the bed partner, um, but our caregivers have been at risk for getting actually even pushed out of bed unintentionally or even hit um, by the patient. Again, unintentionally, this is all happening while they're asleep. Um, and then the other common sleep disturbance that we hear a lot about is excessive daytime sleepiness and napping. Um, which can be uh, really take a toll on sort of uh, the functional level and, and what your expectations are for the day. Apathy is defined as a decline in motivation, drive, and interest. Um, it's fairly common throughout all of the dementias. It's often a big change from the person's prior level in, of engagement. Families often have a lot of trouble getting used to um, this new passivity in a person who was once motivated and very active. Um, families often worry that the person is actually sad and depressed because apathy can often resemble depression and can be mistaken for depression. Um, although I'd like to reassure people that not everyone with apathy is depressed. Um, and families can put a lot of effort into finding ways to engage this person um, in this process um, from what we've found can be tiring and frustrating. And uh, family caregivers often tell us that they feel like they failed because they have been unable to find, you know, sort of that particular activity or, um, uh, or engagement to help that person become more active. Um, and research has really shown that of all the different behaviors, apathy is, is often one of the most distressful overall for families to deal with. Um, and I think in large part because it is pretty difficult to overcome. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about some of the strategies for managing these behavior and mood symptoms. Um, we'll review uh, some common sorts of strategies that you can use. It would be impossible to explore every type of strategy, um, but we really thought that if we could sort of talk about the approach and offer some suggestions to help give you an idea of, of, of ways that you might approach these different uh, behavioral symptoms. And at the end, we'll give you some more resources of where to turn for even more information and support. First, let's, let's go over some of the strategies that in general tend to be um, the most helpful in working with people that have dementia. 
um, having a, a predictable daily routine can be a source of comfort for someone with memory and attentional deficits. So having structure and predictability and, and a minimal amount of surprises um, can really be a source of comfort. Thinking about the environment, um, helping it to be as organized and simplified as possible, free of clutter is really optimal, especially when you think about the visual spatial deficits that accompany these Lewy body diseases. I think it's important to think about the person's cognitive and functional abilities and, and adapt as things change and try to match um, your expectations with the what their abilities are. So, for instance, if if uh, we're pretty certain that this person is suffering from a lot of passivity and apathy. Um, try to acknowledge that, that that's part of the disease instead of thinking that they're just not trying hard enough um, or that they're trying to frustrate you, um, that there's really, um, uh, there's really uh, changes that have happened in the brain that are really affecting this person's drive and motivation. We think in a lot of cases, uh, the mood of people around the person with dementia can be really contagious. So if the people around are, are anxious and worried, um, we think that mood is very easily communicated to our patients. So uh, trying to pay attention to that and, and um, uh, can be really helpful. We also think communication matters a lot in the way you communicate. Um, for a lot of our patients, um, long explanations um, detailed explanations can be overwhelming and hard to follow, and we think also exhausting for the caregiver um, as they try to um, explain things in detail that the person just isn't grasping. Thinking about your own health and well-being as a caregiver is absolutely essential um, and uh, important to, to incorporate into your day. And I think an acknowledgement that there's there are going to be some good days and some bad days and to try not to get too frustrated when it's a bad day and know that there there will be a good day on the horizon, I think is important to, to remember. So let's talk about some specific strategies for managing hallucinations. Um, I think it's not always necessary to try to convince the person that what they're seeing is a hallucination and is not real. Um, it can be often more productive to empath empathize with their feelings and remember that they're not pretending um, to have a hallucination. They're not doing this on purpose, um, but this is a, a real experience for them. Um, you want to assess whether the hallucination is frightening or not. And if it's not frightening for the person, you might simply try to accept it and just offer some supportive reassurance. If the hallucination is scary or frightening, um, again, you don't necessarily want to try to talk the person out of it. This is a really very real experience for them, but you can offer some reassurance. I'm so sorry. That's a scary feeling. Why don't we go into the other room? And sometimes changing the room that you're in or changing um, the, the schedule a bit um, can help um, sort of uh, relieve the person and um, um, help in the situation. Look around the environment. Try to think of it from the person's perspective. Are there visual or auditory uh, things that are happening that are being misperceived by the person or sort of enhancing um, the hallucination and enhancing whether it's a frightening experience for them or not? Um, for instance, you know, the television um, and sounds coming from the television could be adding to the experience for the person. And so again, thinking about the environment, trying to minimize shadows, minimize noises and objects that could appear or sound scary or disturbing for them. Um, we're going to go over a brief case study of a person with hallucinations. Um, in this case, um, this person is in the moderate stage of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and the daughter caregiver, her statement is, uh, my mother insists her parents are in the house with her. They've been dead for years. I try to convince her, but she doesn't believe me. And this is actually a, a fairly common um, sort of hallucination that we do hear about. Um, and uh, so I think some of the strategies might be to assess, again, whether is, is this hallucination upsetting um, to the mother or not. Um, it may be easier to accept it and offer some kind of a supportive statement, such as, tell me a nice memory of your parents instead. Um, if this is upsetting, again, offer support. Don't try to use reasoning or logic. Um, the person, for them, this is a very real experience. Um, and if they're upsetting and you think they might be triggered by photos or objects, you can maybe remove those from the environment. Um, 
if this continues to be a, a, a very negative or upsetting situation, you might talk with the health care provider um, to think about possibly using an antipsychotic. And we have a chart at the end of the slides that kind of reviews the types of medications we think about in these cases. So strategies for managing delusions and capgrass. Um, again, you remember the delusion is caused by the disease. Um, the person is not making this up. Um, no matter how unreal it sounds to you and how unbelievable, um, the, the definition of a delusion is that it's a fixed false belief. Um, and reasoning, we think, in a lot of these cases can be perceived as arguing. So when you try to present logic and reasoning, um, to your loved one, it may feel that uh, you're arguing with them. Um, it, we've seen a lot of times where it seems to just make things worse and it creates a lot of conflict be between the two of you, which is obviously something that we want to avoid. Um, in some ways, if, if you can think about what the delusion is, so um, if the person is convinced that they need to go to work, um, even though they've been retired for many years, think about are there ways to mimic their formal roles in the home. So for instance, paperwork, um, giving them some old checkbooks or filing to do, gardening. Um, are there ways to kind of um, tap into those memories of that work and not necessarily try to talk them out of it, but, but give them something to do that, that feels productive? You can consider a fib. Um, so in the case of a person who's convinced they have to go to work, even though they've been retired for a long time, you might say, you know, the office is closed today. Um, and see if that helps reassure the person. And think about, again, the environment. Make sure it's safe. Um, if the person is really um, very nervous about things and very worried that maybe people are out to get them, making sure that there aren't items in the home that could be used as weapons or any objects that the person might use out of fear. So again, thinking about safety for the person and for you. Um, with the cap grass, I think it's hard, but you know we try to counsel our family members to try to not take it personally. It can, I think it can be really emotionally upsetting when your loved one doesn't recognize you or thinks that you're someone else, thinks that you're an imposter. So, um, but do try not to take it personally. Again, this is their disease. Um, and see if there's someone who can help calm the person. Um, often what we've found in a lot of families is that there may be one person who has that ability to kind of reassure and calm the person. And sometimes just even the, their voice on the phone can be effective at, at calming the person down. And I think in Capgrass too, um, it, it, it goes a little counterproductive of what we normally think about, uh, you know, your role as a caregiver, but you might want to consider some time apart. So we've had spouses that have maybe moved into different bedrooms um, or a hired caregiver or had more help um, so that they actually spend more time apart. Um, and this is a, some tips that we got from one of our wife caregivers who is managing um, cap grass um, for her husband. And again, they, um, we thought that they'd be very useful and sort of helpful to hear from a caregiver's perspective of, of what she said. So acknowledge how frightening and real this is for your partner. Um, in the case that they don't feel like they're in their home, um, they really don't feel like they're in their home. So pointing out uh, familiar furniture and belongings typically doesn't help. And again, what we've seen is often this can be perceived as um, arguing with the person um, and making them feel defensive. Observe from a distance to keep safe. Try leaving for a few minutes. And when you return, see if you're now being perceived as the good or the bad person. Try changing your clothes. Um, talk to them over the phone as your voice may be calming. Don't use FaceTime or video conferencing when they can see your face. It may be easier to sleep in separate rooms. And then again, find other people that may be more reassuring to them. And again, I think this is all really hard and what's really important is to try not to take this personally. And here's a case example, um, again, a case that um, we've seen uh, in a lot of different situations, a case example of a delusion, again, a person in the moderate stage of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, my wife thinks I'm having an affair with our neighbor. When I deny this, she gets angry, hits me, and throws things. No matter what I say, I can't talk her out of believing this. So some strategies you might think of um, in the, in the beginning is look for possible triggers um, to the behavior. So for, an, 
for example? Is it triggered by seeing the neighbor? Um, or is the person, in this case, is, is his wife exhibiting signs of increasing agitation? So sometimes um, families will identify that um, before the person really gets agitated, they notice that they're sort of looking around more. Maybe they start pacing. They seem more restless. And so if you see those signs that things are sort of escalating up, that might be a good time to step in and try to distract them or do something um, that might be more pleasurable, um, to again, to sort of uh, break the escalation of getting into this uh, accusation and, and sort of this physical um, you know, aggression of hitting and throwing things. And so some redirected redirection activities might be a snack, some sort of favorite activity. Sometimes a ride in the car can be really helpful, and it doesn't have to be a long ride. We've had families say that sometimes they just get in the car and they go a few blocks and turn around and come home, and that seems to really help. Um, a statement such as, this is tough, we're going to work through this together, um, can be often more supportive and helpful than trying to use reason or logic um, with them. Um, if necessary, you want to have some physical distance for your own safety, so going outside, leaving the room. In this case, um, the husband would leave the room for a few minutes and let his wife sort of calm down, and it usually she, in this case, calmed down after a few minutes. And then again, if non-medication strategies like this are not effective, uh, talk to the health care provider um, there may be, um, uh, may be time to consider some kind of a medication, an atypical antipsychotic um, for aggressive behavior due to this sort of paranoia. And here's a case study of a person with capgrass. The person was in the early mild stage of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and there were sort of several events, um, not just one sort of statement, but in one event, the patient was the passenger in the car and her husband was driving and she called her daughter on her cell phone asking why she was driving with a strange man. In another episode, while going through airport security, the wife asked her husband who he was and demanded that he leave her alone. In these events, the husband was trying to use reason with her and logic, explain it was her condition that was causing her not to recognize him, and it just would escalate into um, a lot of anger um, um, from her part and, and definitely sadness and distress on his part. So some of the strategies in this case... Um, Consider not traveling. Um, I mean, maybe airport security and traveling to strange places or something that, um, while it used to be enjoyable, just um, may not be possible to do safely any longer. Um, carry a, lot, a letter from the health care provider explaining the, um, the, your loved one's condition or explaining this wife's condition and the symptoms, and that can be helpful um, if you have to present it to law enforcement, or in this case at airport security, there was obviously a lot of concern um, in the situation. Identify people, again, that can help calm this person down and offer reassurance. And in this particular case, um, hearing her daughter's voice on the phone was calming. And so when they were, when the husband and wife were driving in the car, they would they call the daughter on her cell phone and, and the daughter could reassure her that it was okay for her to be in the in the car with this strange man and it was fine. And then thinking about sleeping in separate bedrooms and other me measures of sort of minimizing contact and minimizing um, these sorts of episodes can be really helpful. So let's talk now about some strategies for managing some of the sleep disturbances that happen in these diseases. Um, again, structure. So trying to provide a normal sleep-wake pattern as best as you can. Um, same time to bed, same time to wake up in the morning is often um, going to be really helpful. Uh, create a really calm environment leading up to bedtime. We had a couple that realized that um, the caregiver realized that their normal routine for years had been to watch the news right before bed, and, and that was um, becoming less of an effective um, and productive thing to do um, before bedtime. It was really kind of creating a, a lot more agitation and upset on his wife's behavior. So they had to eliminate that as part of a bedtime ritual. Um, having structure and routine to the bedtime and daytime rituals that become very familiar and comforting. And promoting physical activity during the day. And, and admit it, this is, can be hard to do with somebody who maybe has apathy and is maybe napping a lot during the day. But if you can promote some type of physical activity during the day, going for a walk, an exercise class, something 
um, that can really kind of help promote sort of that natural fatigue that comes at night. Create exposure to natural light during the day and try to minimize um, fluorescent lighting or backlit screens several hours before bedtime can help. Melatonin or trazodone can be useful. Um, talk to your medical provider, your healthcare provider before using any. Melatonin is a naturally occurring hormone within the human body. Um, we think it also has some action in helping with the dream enactment behavior. Um, sometimes people can get um, extra drowsy from using it, daytime drowsiness, but for some people this has been a, a helpful sort of remedy for this, these uh, problems with sleep. Trazodone acts on that serotonin system that's depleted in these disorders, and it, um, it's classified as an antidepressant, so it also helps with depression, but we use it um, even when we think people aren't depressed, but we use it because it, it can be helpful with sleep. Um, it does have some potential side effects, sedation, dizziness, dry mouth, and nausea. So again, you'd want to consult with the healthcare provider and see if this would be a, a safe medication to use. And then we always like to remind people to avoid sedating medications that it can actually increase confusion, such as Benadryl um, or the PM formulation, such as Tylenol or Advil PM. The, the, the PM formulation is actually Benadryl, which we think can really create a lot of confusion and cognitive um, uh, deficits, in, especially in older people. So here's a case study of a person with sleep disturbance. They're in the moderate stage of Lewy body uh, disease. Um, according to the caregiver, um, my husband thrashes about in his sleep. He acts like he's trying to get away from someone. When I wake him up, I have to hold his arm so he won't hit me by accident. <clears throat> so clearly we're concerned about the caregiver's safety in this, in this case. Um, so think about alternative ways of waking the person up. Um, can you turn on the room light? Uh, can you call them by name rather than sort of going physically close and, and risk being hit? Um, a lot of our caregivers um, have started sleeping with bed pillows down the middle of the bed. Um, they may uh, sleep in a different bed or room, um, again, to, as a way to kind of maintain their, their own safety and to help them to sleep during the night. And um, I think just be as uh, emotionally reassuring as you can. This is obviously a frightening event uh, for your loved one if they um, are in the middle of a state where they feel like they're um, having to escape from someone or have to rescue someone. So you want to be as reassuring, emotionally reassuring as you can. And then again, you could talk to the healthcare provider to consider medication such as clonazepam um, for this sort of uh, um, sleep behavior. So strategies for managing apathy. Um, I think first off, um, it's good to sort of make, just don't assume that old activities and hobbies that were once familiar and fun for the person with dementia um, are still fun and familiar. Um, they may, it may be that these hobbies and these activities have become too complicated, too difficult, too confusing. Um, so again, sort of think about what the person's cognitive and functional abilities are and try to match the activities with what their abilities are rather than um, uh, hoping and relying on that they're going to still think the things that were fun 10 years ago are still fun and enjoyable now. I think it's important to try to accept that the apathy is a symptom of dementia. Try not to think of the person as being lazy or that they just aren't trying hard enough. I think it can be hard to do. Um, but try to think of it more as a symptom of their dementia. And in terms of daily routines, we think it uh, can be helpful to not ask open-ended question that often result in the person just saying no or nothing. For example, instead of asking, what do you want to do today? Um, you might get the answer, which is nothing, I'm fine. And instead, you might ask something more specific, more of sort of a forced choice. So what coat do you want to wear for our walk? or let's go now for a ride in the car. And again, setting a routine for activities can be helpful um, because they become expected um, a part of the day and maybe something that the person is less likely to say no to. And I think it's important to recognize there, there are no medications to improve apathy. Um, so of all the behaviors um, 
this is one that really stands out is that we really have to rely on kind of these non-medication or environmental approaches. So the way you communicate and the way you set up the day becomes um, very important um, in how to manage it. In a case study of a person with apathy, this person is in the early mild stage of Parkinson's disease with dementia. And the husband caregiver says, my wife used to do so much. She was a social butterfly. Now I can't get her out of the house. And she says no to her friends who want to take her out to lunch. So some of the strategies. First, I think it's always important to make sure that you don't think that the person is depressed um, because depression could possibly be treated. And again, it's important. It's it difficult sometimes to distinguish apathy from depression because they same, share a lot of the same features, but it's still important to sort of consider. Um, changing the way you communicate might be helpful. So instead of asking, do you want to meet your friends, um, which often results in the answer of no, you might say, your friends will be here in a half an hour, time to find your shoes. Again, something that's a little more directive and you're not really asking for a yes or no question uh, answer thinking about more passive activities um, might be easier for the person with dementia who's who's apathetic so perhaps going for a drive in the car together might actually be enjoyable for both of you and, and might sort of the, that that activity level might sort of be a better match for the person and um, again acknowledge that these diseases have an impact on the areas of the brain that control our motivation and drive so try not to take it personally um, and, and again um, kind of acknowledge that this is probably a symptom of, of disease. Now another um, change that we want to talk about is called delirium which is defined as an acute confusional state and it's delirium is really different from dementia dementia we think has a kind of a gradual onset it progresses very gradually um, and whereas delirium is very acute so it often has a sudden onset um, sometimes in hours to days uh, caregivers will describe a change um, and Cognitive abilities um, often fluctuate during the day. And again, this makes it a little bit hard with the Lewy body disorders because um, the people that have Lewy body disorders often have this fluctuating cognitive abilities. Um, so it can be kind of hard to distinguish the two. But, um, but what we mean is that there's often uh, poor attention. It often fluctuates throughout the day, better attention at some parts of the day and worse attention later. Uh, delirium is often associated with very disorganized thoughts and often disorientation. In delirium, the sleep-wake cycle is often disrupted and even reversed. So people might be sleeping during the day and awake all night. And there may be uh, new or worsening in behaviors that are already present. So even more anxiety or hyperactivity, even more apathy and more daytime sleepiness. Um, more enhanced delusions or paranoid belief, and maybe new hallucinations. And again, the take-home point is that delirium is really different from dementia. Um, it is often, um, we think, due to an uh, underlying medical cause, so not an expected uh, uh, change that we would expect to see uh, because the person has dementia. So strategies for managing delirium. Again, you want to talk to the healthcare provider because again, we think delirium can be a sign of infection, it could be a sign of constipation, it can be a side effect of a medication, some sort of metabolic disturbance. So it's more of an acute problem that really needs medical attention. Um, and again, it can be hard to distinguish a delirium in somebody who has a Lewy body disorder because some of these signs um, are very similar in terms of fluctuating attention and, and sleep-wake problems. But if you see these sort of sudden changes that um, you can really identify when they started, like it was several hours ago or a day or so ago, then I think you, we want you to think about delirium. It's important to promote uh, good food and fluid intake throughout this, help the person feel safe and protected, try your best to reinforce normal sleep-wake patterns, and then optimize uh, the sensory input for the person. So if they wear hearing aids, make sure they wear their hearing aids. If they have glasses, have them wear their glasses and think about the room lighting and noise level, um, really trying to optimize their environment and sort of support them um, until this delirium can be resolved. 
And then um, I mentioned different medications and classes of medications that we might consider um, with some of these behavioral symptoms. And so this list is here. It'll be available um, on this recorded talk um, for you to go back and look at. We think of the antidepressant class of medications, um, even though, and we use them for depression and anxiety, we sometimes use them for other reasons, um, like the trazodone, we often might use that for sleep, not necessarily for depression or anxiety. There are atypical antipsychotics, and then medications that we might think about for sleep problems. And then a really important part of all of this sort of care is taking care of yourself as the caregiver. Um, no one can really do this alone um, to provide this sort of care 24-7. Asking for help and getting respite, getting a break um, does not mean you're failing as a caregiver. Um, it means that you're getting the help that, that you really actually need. So respite is defined as taking a break from getting help with caregiving. Um, some different ways to think about getting respite is to think about a day program for your loved one. Senior center, senior exercise programs um, are all things that can help um, provide that person with, some, with quality of life and activity, um, but also may give you a break um, from the day-to-day -day care. Um, for yourself, think about a pleasurable activity. Um, and maybe it's something you haven't had time to do and um, try to figure out what would need to happen in order you, for you to, to re-engage in that activity. And then emotional and practical support and guidance from a support group, your healthcare provider, a counselor, a close friend, um, are all uh, ingredients that we think are, are very necessary for managing uh, caregiving and, and promoting your own health and well-being. And uh, these uh, resources are not in any particular order, but um, these are all uh, sites that have resources, support, and staff that are trained and can offer expert guidance. So we encourage everybody to get to know them. Um, many of these organizations, such as the Alzheimer's Association, have local offices. So if you look at their, their main website, you can find a local office in your community. And again, we'll have all these posted on the, in the webinar on the website so that you can explore them uh, more fully in your own time. And so let's review what we've talked about today. Um, number one, protein accumulation and changes in neurotransmitters in specific parts of the brain contribute to these behavioral and mood changes that we see in the LBD disorders. Environmental strategies, non-medication strategies are necessary components of managing behaviors to ensure the health and well-being of both our patients and our caregivers. Environmental strategies um, uh, typically include supportive communication, maintaining structure and predictability to the day and night, and acknowledging and adapting to the person's cognitive and functional abilities. Delirium or this sudden acute confusion warrants notification of the person's health care provider as it may indicate an acute medical problem. And then finally, we want to acknowledge, acknowledge our funders, the Administration on Aging, the Administration for Community Living through the Department of Health and Human Services provided funding uh, for these trainings, and um, we are grateful for their support.